Greetings and welcome to the fifth lecture in the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute series entitled, We Have Lived in Southeast Alaska Since Time Immemorial. I am Chuck Smythe, Director of the Culture and History Department. SHI has started construction of its arts campus in downtown Juneau, which will expand opportunities for education and art. If you are interested in making a donation to the arts campus, please visit sealaskaheritage.org slash campus. The title of today's lecture is Overview of the Diné Languages and the Place of Thingit in Na Diné. As you watch the lecture, we invite you to submit questions via the chat box in YouTube. Dr. Lear has graciously agreed to answer questions at the end of his presentation. Dr. Jeffrey A. Lear is a professor emeritus of linguistics at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, where he was from 1973 to 2011. He began his self-motivated study of Tlingit during high school and later began teaching Tlingit as well as the orthographies of the Eskimo, Aleut, and Athabascan languages of Alaska at Alaska Methodist University and then at Mount Edgecombe Boarding School and Sheldon Jackson College. He moved to the Alaska Native Language Center where he centered his work on the Tlingit, Haida, Supiak, Alutic languages, as well as comparative Athabascan and comparative Nadine studies. He was instrumental in designing the modern orthographies for the Tlingit, Haida, Yupik, Supiak, Alutic, Atna, and Tanacross languages and cultivated an interest in Nadine. He completed his doctoral degree from the University of Chicago in 1991, while at the same time starting work on the Athabascan EAC Tlingit lexical database and comparative Athabascan lexical database. At present, Jeff is working for the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, focusing on several projects involving documentation of the Tlingit language and development of classroom material. Dr. Lear. You may begin. Uh, hello. Uh, welcome to this uh, lecture called the overview of the Diné languages and the place of Clinket in uh, Diné. So I'm going to be talking about uh, Nadine languages as a group first, and then I'm going to uh, transition into talking about the Diné or Athabascan languages, and finally come back to Tlingit dialectology, and then uh, more broadly look at the uh, Nadine language, uh, the the theoretical possibility of where a Nadine language uh, uh, homeland might have been. So here we go. Here's a map that shows the, um, <clears throat> the uh, distri oops, distribution of the, uh, the uh, Nadine languages we have Iak right here in gold. We have Tlingit here in brown. And we have a very rough uh, outline of the Athabascan languages in red here. So um, let me see, how do I get out of this thing? Whoops, well, here. Oh, oh, I did something wrong here. I don't know how to. I don't know how to, ah, shoot. I don't know how to get this hand out of the, ah, oh dear. It no, I... Does it exit out of that? Yeah, okay, there, there. Okay, I, what I wanted was this. Okay, now let's go. Okay, so here's, uh, pen. all right, so here's the yak, clink it and Athabascan. Okay, 
Here's a map that shows uh, more broadly and more specifically where the Athabascan languages are. Uh, you can see up here the, the languages extend from almost the lower Yukon all the way up into uh, all the way along the Pacific coast of Athabascan um, and then down into Northern Canada over here, all the way over to Hudson Bay, and then into BC and uh, uh, Alberta. I think that's Alberta, uh, or anyway, uh, down here into uh, carrier territory called Dakesh nowadays, to Tina on the plains, and then some, some, uh, Oregon, Washingtonian, Pacific Coast languages, some of which are now extinct, such as Nicola, um, Kaliwaka, Klatskanai, and then there's the Oregon complex and the California complex. And we also have Southern, Southwest Athabascan, consisting of Navajo and the Apache languages here. Um, one of the most important uh, parts of the evidence that not the Nadalai languages consisting of Athabascan, Eyak, and Tlingit are in fact related comes from the verb, the structure of the verb. Um, this chart comes from a, a uh, uh, encyclopedia article I once did showing the comparisons here. So um, we look at the root here. We see the suffixes that can occur with the root in um, Nadane, in pre-proto-Athabascan, in Eyak, and in Tlingit. There are a number of them, some of which I didn't list. Um, and you can see some of the suffixes like the G suffix and the, uh, what we now write as underline X suffix occur in all branches. Um, then uh, before the root come these uh, valence prefixes, which we call classifiers in the modern languages. And you can see uh, uh, the, this, the valence prefixes get mixed up with the stative prefix. So all three, the stative prefix, the valence prefix, and the, and the two valence prefixes end up combining into a single thing that we call the classifier in Tlingit. And then after that come the subject prefixes, which you can see are fairly similar in Athabascan Eyak, but uh, kind of interestingly different in Tlingit. And we have aspect mode, and you can see some of those in Athabascan Eyak. And we have one of them that shows up in Tlingit, but we don't find any clear uh, uh, correspondence with the rest of them, uh, except for maybe this u being related to this e or this a, uh. but that's hard to prove. And then we get um, incorporated no nouns, incorporated nominal prefixes. Uh, there's just a ton of them in Tlingit. There are a number of them in Athabascan EAC and so forth. So those are the main things that, that uh, show us the similarities in the verb. There are also interesting similarities in the noun between Athabascan and Tlingit, but not so much in Eyak. Uh, as we uh, students of Tlingit probably know that a non-possessed noun is converted into a possessed noun by adding a suffix which can occur as e or ye or u or wu. And then in Athabascan, on the other hand, we have uh, a suffix 
uh, e glottal stop, it, which seems which has the same function and seems to be perfectly relatable to the singit suffix. So on the, as nouns also, we have uh, 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 very good evidence of relationship. Now here, I just wanted to show you just a little bit about this, um, uh, the classifier element, the classifier, just to show you the classifier is kind of like a little engine all in, that sort of does all these, uh, the, there's all these little calculations about what elements are supposed to be included in the classifier. And these are partly lexical and partly imposed by the grammar. So uh, we see that we take Nadane, we had four elements. We had this stative element or stative perfective element, Yi. We have the Bardell element. They can combine in this order. And in fact, in Athabaskan and Eak, we find them combining in exactly the same order. Whereas in Tlingit, they reverse. The, the E element comes after the Bardell element. Um, then we have the forms with the D included. So we have the D by itself, which is da and shows up as da throughout Athabascan Eak and da in Tlingit. And then we have uh, the I plus the D, which gives D. In this case, the, there's a, uh, what looks like a metathesis. And then we have the plus the D. Uh, let me go to the next slide here. Athabascan, not an plus D, D plus vowel becomes Athabascan EAC or plus vowel simply by dropping the D. Next slide, proto nodene ye plus or minus plus D becomes ye plus or minus D by vowel assimilation. And then the unnecessary prefix ye is dropped. So you just get either D or D. And then that gets simplified to uh, la or si, si in the uh, in uh, Athabascan Yak. But in Tlingit, on the other hand, what happens is this: Tlingit uh, uh, da drops after a classifier prefix element such as la. So we just get the da dropping, and just get. Um, finally, um, uh, not an HD becomes pre-clinket by assimilation. And then the unnecessary is dropped, yielding gli. <clears throat> and the same thing happens with the other fricative classifier elements. So this just gives you a little tiny glimpse of how the classifier system has evolved in Nadane and why it is so important in uh, the identification of Nadane as a, uh, a, a language phylum. That is to say a very distant uh, uh, fa language family with a lot of depth to it. Okay, we wanna look now at Athabascan dispersal. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the Athabascan homeland just yet. I want to look at Athabascan dispersal. So uh, from this country, which is uh, where the lakes, basically the lakes at the head of the Yukon River, uh, the lakes at the head of the Yukon River drain out into the Yukon River. Um, my hypothesis is that the first migration was down the Yukon River and way down into what is now called uh, Deghatan, that is to say in Gallic, it used to be called in Gallic territory. The Deg language is remarkably aberrant from other Alaskan languages. 
showing an apparent split in the reflexes of uh, PA palatal stops like k, whereby some became velars like k, and others became alveolo palatal such as ch. And there are other really interesting developments, especially in the sonorant system, that set Dig apart from all other Alaskan, uh, all other Athabascan languages. Then we also see uh, these languages, uh, Southern Tuchoni, Tagish, Kaska, and Taltan are all low marked language. And interestingly enough, so is dog rib over here. Uh, it is certain, currently surrounded by high tone marked languages, Northern Tuch uh, Tuchoni, North Slavey, Bear Lake, Mountain, South Slavey, um, Chipuya, uh, Denesunchina, and Yellowknife. So I think that this might indicate that the dog group were the first people to reach Eastern Canada. And in fact, then were, uh, were encircled by these high tone languages and their uh, territory shrunk as a result. Now for Southern Athabascan, uh, we see uh, this area here probably being the area that, from which uh, the first migration down the coast took place, uh, down into Northern Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, it gave rise to these uh, pockets of Athabascan languages, Nicola, Hualeku, Klatskanai, Umpqua, um, the, uh, the Southern Oregon dialect complex, um, the uh, Hupa, Nongat, and all of these, and Matol. Okay. Now, um, now stage two is of course a lot more complex. The way I see it is that there was a two prong migration from Alaska in the north here. One following the route down the Yukon River that was earlier forged by the ancestors of the Deg Khat An, giving rise to Han, which in and Koyakon, and maybe even the Halakachuk language here. Now, the other branch went across the pass here um, from what the area of what is now, um, uh, what's it called, Haines Crossing. I forget what the name of the town is, uh, where the Alaska Highway goes down through, um, through Scotty Lake and into the upper Tanana region. And from there down the, um, to Can across Lower Tanana, Middle Tanana, Lower Tanana. And also into uh, Atna territory and Denaya territory. So ultimately also uh, ending up on, partially on the Pacific coast. Now green. There was apparently a, a, south, a push into the plains here, uh, symbolized by the green. <clears throat> so we get secondly beaver, which now we have to consider to be a separate branch of Athabascan. Uh, we also get Tsutina down here. And these languages show some lexical similarities that I noticed when working on the Athabascan EAC, uh, when working on the comparative Athabascan database. Um, they, but also, so we have a linguistic connection between Sekhani Beaver and Tsutina, but we also find a really interesting connection between Tsutina and Southern Athabascan, Southwest Athabascan here, Navajo and Apache, uh, which we will I'll talk about in a little in a minute here. Uh, so, like I say here, we find insulated, isolated instances of vocabulary shared only by Sekhani Beaver and Tsutina on the one hand, 
and instances of vocabulary shared only by Tsut in the and Southwest Athabascan, such as Navajo, on the other hand. Now the the yellow. So I'm uh, that makes me think that uh, the ancestors of the Southwest Athabascans were probably in close proximity with the Tsut in the and probably second e beaver as well. So I'm sort of hypothetically putting them there just to give them a place to disperse down um, along uh, this side of the uh, mountain range and come into and split up. The first out, the first split off must have been the Plains Apache they have a different uh, set of consonant correspondences than what we find in Navajo and the rest of Apache. So even though this is labeled Apache, it really is a separate branch of Southwest Athabasca. Now, here's another really interesting fact. Um, like Sekhani Beaver, Tsut in a, and Southwest Athabascan were originally low tone marked languages. But Tsut and Southwest Athabascan share a unique innovation. What were originally unmarked long vowels appear with high tone in these low tone marked languages, but originally unmarked short vowels appear with mid tone in Tsut and low tone in Southwest Athabascan. This low tone tone lowering process has resulted in the predominance of low tone syllables in Southwest Athabascan, so that the tone marking in this branch has been virtually turned on its heads. Originally unmarked long vowels are written with high tone marking, whereas originally marked vowels, together with originally unmarked short vowels, are written without tone marking. And I put a little comment here on how this is similar to what has happened also in the history of Schlinget. Now, turning to the blue up here, from the Northern Tuchoni, Northern Tuchoni is high tone mark. Um, and so is North Slavy. So I'm thinking that there was probably, the dis center of dispersal here was probably uh, right around here. There was probably um, uh, an encirclement of the old dog rib uh, area by these high tone languages that kind of like some of them went down South Slavy, Dines, Sunkhine, and Yellowknife, and others went kind of this way. So they encircled the dog rib area. Um, And also this high, tar high tone uh, Northern Tuchoni uh, is also, we also find uh, a very closely, a very, uh, uh, a language which is not that far distant, namely Tanacross, which is also a high tone marked languages, but it's surrounded by low tone marked languages. So we get these two pockets uh, that are rather interesting. Now here, just to show you some of the complexity that we are actually working with to reach these conclusions, some of these conclusions, we give a, um, a map of Athabascan tone marking. The yellow marking only occurs here in Upper Tanana, which has traditionally been considered a low uh, tone mark language. But on this, uh, John Ritter had me listen to some of these uh, uh, recordings of older Upper Tanana speakers. And what we heard was not so much low tone marking as what we would think as being very much like Proto-Athabascan constriction. And then right next to it, we get a red mark, mark languages. And then downstream of that, we get a blue, uh, a blue mark language. So the blue mark languages are low marked. Uh, 
they have the tone marking is low and we have like which in uh han lower tana middle tana southern tuchoni tagish casca taltan zekani beaver and all by itself over here dog rib now the green is where we get this low marked tone, but with low tone lowering of unmarked syllables that I talked about just now. This occurs in Tsutina where the unmarked um, uh, short, originally short syllables or reduced syllables are uh, get, have now have mid tone. So, Tsutena has three tones, high tone from originally unmarked long syllables, mid tone from originally unmarked short syllables, and low tone for originally marked syllables. And then we have in, um, in these Southwest Athabathian languages, that mid tone of Tsutena has merged with low tones. We get mostly we get a lot more low mar tone marking in these language, uh, these uh, Southwest Athabascan languages. So that's why we colored these in green, just so you get a better picture. Now the red, the purple languages uh, pr are high tone marked. Uh, so we have ten across, and then this and Northern Tuchoni and this Slavey. Uh, yellow knife uh, uh, band here that sur uh, surrounds dog rib. <clears throat> also, we have carrier and chilcotin all by themselves. Then we have uncolored areas, which are probably the majority of the languages, which some, most of them don't have tone marking, others we don't know. So most of the Alaskan languages here. Uh, are, as you can see, are, don't have tone marking. Same for it's out, we don't know. It probably did have tone marking, but Boaz did not mark it. We have Babin with Uten, no tone marking. And then all of these, we don't know about Nicola, and, but we do know that, say, these Southern Athabascan languages and the Northern Athabascan Pacific Coast languages do not have tone marking. So that gives us a picture of how all of these migrations, uh, an incomplete picture of how all of these migrations resulted in a kind of a, um, an interesting pattern on the map. We can see that low marking goes all the way from the northernmost Alaska, all the way down to the southernmost Southwest Athabascan languages. Whereas the red high tone marking is a lot more broken up. Okay. So here's a taxonomy, a work. This is my working concept of the taxonomy of the Athabascan languages. And I want to point out that other taxonomies have been put forward and uh, they don't agree with necessarily with the taxonomy I have put forth here. But my taxonomy is based on years of lexical research. So I have, I'm fairly confident about a lot of it. So I have first the Alaskan branch, of course, Degretan being on a separate uh, track here, Yukon Athabascan and Tananon Pacific. Okay, those are the two branches that migrated down later. Then there is Yukon Territory and Northern BC. By the way, this these initials like A and Y are the ones I use in my database to give an idea of where a certain lexical item is found to give a general idea. Um, so we have these uh, these Santuchoni, Tagish, Taltan, and Casca. But again, I'm not. Sh I don't know all that much about Taltan and Casca. I haven't done lexical work on them. 
So I don't know if they should actually be separated out as a, a separate branch. Uh, and then there's Northern Tuchoni, which is high mark. Then Eastern Canadian dog rib, again, kind of an isolate, and it maybe should be a separate branch. And then this uh, Dennis uh, Slavy Dennis Unclina complex. Then transitional is a separate branch. I classify it separately because it is so different from anything else, namely Tsekena, Tsekeni, and Beaver, which is more or less a dialect complex. Then British Columbia, Watsun, but Watsutin, but Bean, Carrier and Chilcotin, and maybe Nicola, we don't know. And then Tutina or Sarsi is on its own branch. And then Southwest, which we've already talked about. Uh, Plains Apache being its own sub-branch and the rest being a separate sub-branch. Then the Pacific Coast, you can see Kualiuka uh, Klatskanai, Umpqua, Southern Oregon Dialect Complex, Northern Oregon, and then another nor Northern Oregon branch, which consists just of Matol Bear River, which are basically two dialects of the same language. These are different enough from Hoopa and all of these, this dialect complex here to warrant them being in a separate sub branch. Now, by the way, before I go on, I want to give a great big shout out to Will Geiger, who put together this uh, PowerPoint presentation for me. And uh, uh, really did a great job in organizing and uh, making everything very nicely uh, visible. And I'd like to also thank Nobu for doing this map for us. And I'd like to thank Devil and Anderstrom for helping clarify the characteristics of uh, some of these di uh, these dialects surrounding Yakutat, the uh, Qashiach the uh, Yakutat itself and the dry bay. So, um, Northern Klinkit, Pasyach, uh, Yakutat, dry bay, Teslin, Karkaras, Chilkat, Chilkut, Una and Ak Bay, uh, all of these. Uh, short E and U are not syncopated as in Southern and transitional Klinkit. There's a two-way tone distinction. Southern clinket high and long high and long falling vowels merge as long high vowels in transitional and southern clinket. And short vowels are as a rule low tone before the stem, whereas a short stem vowel and short vowels following the stem are high toned. In the, but in transitional clinket, um, we find a sort of a mix. We get this syncopation of short E and U. Sometimes, maybe not all the time, but uh, sometimes at least in open syllables after a vowel. So for example, like instead of saying ashuka, they'll say ashkwa. Instead of saying huasiku, they'll say huasku, uh, those sorts of things. So in Southern Clinket also, we have the syncopation of short E and U in short, in open syllables after a vowel. And there, but unlike uh, Northern and transitional Clinket, there is a three-way distinction between types of long vowels, which is a stigmatic distinction in Tongas and a tonal distinction in Sanya and Hinya. Okay, so let's look at the map here. This is um, Tongas or Tant Aquan. Some people identify it with Tant Aquan. And uh, this is Sanya. Um, and then here is Hinya. These three are uh, what I consider to be uh, Southern Clinket. You know, I, quintessential Southern Clinket. They have all both vowel syncopation and the three way distinction between types of long vowels um, in 
Sanya and Hinya, those three distinctions being tonal, namely high, falling, and low. But in transitional clinket, as in northern clinket, the three-way distinction between high and low vowels has been, limp, has been narrowed so that high and falling long vowels merge as high vowels. So you just get a high-low distinction as in northern clinket. But you do get the syncopation of short e and u where applicable. Okay, so, and also you'll notice that no color was assigned to the Kuyu dialect. Their communities were uh, decimated by the measles epidemic and the survivors moved to Kowak and elsewhere. So we don't know the original characteristics of this dialect. Okay, uh, now to look more closely at Northern Clinket. Um, uh, okay, Yakutat, Dry Bay, and Teslin. There is variation between stem rhymes ich or ich and u and u, and between ik and ik and uk and uk or uk. Also ik or ik and uk or and uk. Now in Teslin speakers accept, for example, both yanik and yanuk, it hurts, or he or she is in, sick or in pain. But in Yakutat, maybe some speakers would vary between the two, yanik or yanuk, and some might only use yanuk. Now all interior Clinket speakers, uh, Teslin, Carcross, and Atlan, use the stem ni rather than ne as in yewu ni, whereas in Yakutat, some speakers use ni and others use ne. Okay, now looking at Qashyakh here, and, oh wait, yeah, Qashyakh here, Karkas here, Chilkat, Chilkut, and Hun. Okay, these dialects usually change the stem rhymes ich or ich to uh or uh, ich to ik to uk or uk, and ik to, and ik to uk or uk. They also tend to use ne as in yewu ne rather than ni. Then we get to these dialects here, which are in kind of like blue. These dialects, tend, uh, uh, so we have here um, Ak, Taku, Sumdam, Angun, and Sitka. These dialects tend to agree with Southern Clinket on two points, that they retain e the stem rhymes Ich and Ich, Ik and Ik, uh, Ik and Ik, and they use the stem Ni as in Yewu Ni. Now, the transitional dialects. As I said before, short u and e are, are sometimes syncopated in open syllables after a vowel. And as in Northern Clinket, there's a two-way distinct tone distinction. And then I'd already talked about these. Uh, Inya has a three-way tone marking. Both short vowels occur both high and low. Long vowels occur as long falling, oops, it should say long high, long falling, and long low. Uh, that was a mistake in the typing. Um, Sonia, pretty much the same, except that short vowels are always high. And we don't get this, so we don't get this high load distinction in short vowels. But we get the same three high, high, long high, long falling, and long low vowels. And then in Tongas, as we said, we get a stigmatic form of vowel marking, which doesn't really include tone per se. So we get short vowels, which are pronounced at a high pitch. We get lengthened vowels, which are also pronounced with a relatively high pitch. Glottalized vowels, which are also pronounced with a relatively high pitch. And fading vowels, which acoustically, because of the opening of the glottis, started a relatively high pitch and just 
droop off to where there is no pit. Okay. Now, ah, here comes the fun part. Possible homelands for the Nadane language branches. Okay, this emphasizes the word possible here. I'm gonna see if I can move this down so we get a better picture here. Okay. okay. All right, so um uh, let me see. Okay. Um now about EAC. Krauss points out that while the EAC rootly generally translates as deeply back inside a cavity, and so like inside of a cave or inside of a a big uh, basket or something like that. It is puzzling that as a directional, it translates downstream. Now, why would deeply back inside the cavity mean downstream? Well, he speculated um, that this might have been a linguistic relic of the time when, hypothetically, ancestral EX could have lived in the Copper River Valley. So that going downstream in this context could have referred to going toward the glacial cul-de-sac, deeply back inside that covers the uh, Copper River. That's hypothetical. So that's one of the reasons why I included uh, part of the Copper River maybe as part of the ancestral EAC home grounds. I also noticed that the name, place name Jishkat Chilkat is not at all analyzable in Tlingit, whereas this place name occurs in the Eak area referring to the Bering River and the Bering River village. And in Eak, it is more clearly analyzable. The variants that Krauss found are Jishkat, which by the way, might actually be simply a borrowing of the clinket form, which was, uh, which they probably knew, but uh, was actually uh, borrowed, was given to this place name. The clinkets adopted it, and then the EX might have adopted the clinket pronunciation. What appears to be a more uh, genuine EX variant of this is Jitka which literally translates caches, caches, chish, ka, among, t, place. That is to say, place among the caches, caches. And then there's also jish, ka, ya, t, um, which is the name for the Bering River village. Now, the yak word chish, cache, or platform cache, like, Clinket Chish and Northern, uh, Southern Clinket Chish and Northern Clinket Chush. Both, all three of those are, bar are borrowed from the EAC, uh, the Athabasca, Proto what appears in Proto Athabascan is Chush, plat uh, platform cache. Um, now, the fact that this name is analyzable in EAC caches among place, at least this second form, which I think is probably the more original name for Bering River, um, provides rather strong evidence that the Chilkat area was originally settled by the EAC. And I note also that we need to take a careful look at other far northern Clinket place names to see if other EAC place names have been, been adapted into Clinket. Now about Dry Bay. This is really interesting here, Dry Bay. The late Abraham, uh, Elaine Abraham told me that her mother said that the people of Dry Bay were leaner and had a lighter complexion than the local Clinket and Eak peoples. She thought they might have been a distinct race of people. Devlin Anderstrom also recounts that his late grandmother, Lena Farkas, thought that the people of Dry Bay originally spoke either a dialect of Eak or a language closely related to Eak. So this area here is of special import interest because this might not have, the people here, if we'd 
been able to go back a couple hundred years, we might have found them speaking a fourth Nadane, uh, bran uh, uh, we might have found a fourth branch of Nadane, or at least the second branch of Iyak. Now, finally, I have noted in my paper called Evidence for a Northern Northwest Coast Language Area, colon, promiscuous possessive constructions in Haida, Iyak, and Aleut, a rare typological trait which I have called promiscuous number marking found most prominently in these three languages, Haida, Iyak, and Aleut. I conclude that this evidence suggests that these languages may have been essentially contiguous in ancient times, perhaps about 3,000 years ago, but that's entirely speculative. This would imply that Iyak or related languages may have originally occupied this northern part of what is now Southeast Alaska, whereas Haida or related languages may have originally occupied the southern part and that the historical spread of Tlingit has wedged these two apart. But of course, we don't know. Maybe there, is, there were other languages here uh, in between that also had promiscuous number marking. We just simply, this is all uh, quite hypothetical, but very interesting to think about. Okay, about the Athabascan homeland. I've long considered this area the, uh, the most probable candidate for the homeland to be this lake complex uh, northwest of the glaciated Alaska mountain range that now separates Alaska and Canada, especially including those lakes that drain into the Yukon River. This, I, uh, this offers an ideal starting points for migration east into Alaska, down the Yukon River, and elsewhere, down the Tanana, as well as uh, migrations down into uh, British Columbia, and further down into uh, the Pacific Coast, along the Pacific Coast and into the American Southwest. Now, the possible thing that homeland. This is also quite uh, speculative. Now, Sanya oral uh, Tlingit oral history provides clues that the Tlingit may first have reached the coast in the area of Portland Canal and Rivia Fijedo Island. Uh, sorry, I can't quite locate those. Well, here's probably, I think this is Rivia Fijedo Island. Um, from there, moving northwest along the coast, there is an also, also an important and widely known oral history of Tlingit migrating down this this the Stikine River here, and again going under, uh, going over the some going under the ice on rafts, and some are crossing the glacier on ice on foot. So I venture to guess, and that's guess that the Tlingit ancestral homeland was primarily inland and centered on what is the southern part of what is now the Yukon territory here. Okay, then. Now, again, this is speculative. I'm giving my best guess uh, as a linguist compared to other uh, language families that we know of, such as Indo-European. Um, okay, I would say that Proto-Athabascan probably began to split up about 2,500 years before present. That again is just an educated guess that is somewhat longer than the supposed split up of the Germanic languages in Indo-European. Now, uh, we'd have to go a ways further back to get to Athabascan Eak. I think we'd have to go about 1500 years further. So Athabascan Eak would probably take us to 14,000 before present, roughly. And that's when Eak could have split off from Athabascan, or the, the pre-Proto-Athabascan. 
And then finally, this Athabascan EAC could have split up maybe uh, maybe a thousand years or maybe a little more uh, after the split up of Nadane, which I'm putting at maybe 5,000, but that's a real guess. It might have been uh, long, older than that. But from there, we get a split to leading to Athabasca and Eak on the one hand and to Tlingit on the other. And we don't have much of a, uh, Tlingit is all one language. It has dialects, but the dialects have very little, uh, show very little what we call time depth. Linguists call time depths. That is, we take the branches that we can identify, uh, that exist presently and say, okay, how long would it take for these dialects to branch out from one another? And we estimate that uh, and we call it the time depth of uh, Tlingit dialects. So Tlingit doesn't have much time depth in terms of uh, dialect uh, differentiation. EAC has virtually none because there were only like 10 speakers when they started working on this and they were all in Cordova. I mean, there were Yakutat speakers, but uh, very little in the way of distinctive differences were noted. So Yak, we'd have to say has zero time depth as composed with, uh, as compared with Athabascan, which has a considerable time depth. Okay, then, thank you. Uh, for listening to the presentation. Let's see, we are eight minutes ahead of schedule. Um, what am I supposed to do here now? I think I need to escape and wait. Alrighty, well, thank you very much, Jeff. Stop share. And uh, yeah, we will um, move to questions. If uh, I'm looking in our on our uh, YouTube chat, I, there is a question about Jilkat. Oh, right. That, uh, and it, it, it relates to the ethnographic meaning of that mm -hmm. term uh, among the Thingit mm -hmm. Northern Lynn Canal area. And uh, it's, it's considered that it refers to the custom of caching frozen salmon packed in layers of snow and ice in pits on the river's bank located mm -hmm. in the front of their houses. And, and the, river, the river is similarly named for its wealth of salmon. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's considered that's why there are, uh, that name applies to that area, that place name. Right. So, so the question is, are there similar conditions, practices up, up in the north? Um, frozen salmon in, in uh, stacks, you know, in uh, layers of snow and ice in pits? I wish I could answer that question definitively. I just, uh, I am not, I'm not fit to, to answer uh, anthropological questions. I, I just don't know, unfortunately. Yeah. You'd be better to ask a, an anthropologist, maybe an anthropologist will get on the chat and answer that question. But I did want to point out one thing that's interesting that the Tlingit that have, have been interviewed have identified that as having to do with caches because the Northern Tlingit term for cache is chit. And whereas this word has jit caught, and the jit is just like the eak jit meaning cache. So uh, it's interesting that they would know that because it's not obvious on the surface that jit is the same thing as chut. I mean, you know, yeah. so they must have some oral history going there that goes back to uh, what they had, what it suggests to me that they had learned from the EAC that jish actually is the same as chat, 
or they knew that somehow. How did they know that? Probably from oral history. Well, they also were traders. Yeah. Well-known mm -hmm. traders journeying yeah. into the interior for, yeah. for uh, eons. Who knows how long that went on. Right. But they were very adventurous and widely traveled. Uh, mm -hmm. But I find it interesting that it's related to a, to a cultural practice there. Mm -hmm. We have another question that is uh, related to your Grano-Glotto-Chronology, Grano and that is, are, mm -hmm. are your t is your timeline based on Glotto-Chronology estimates? Yes, it is. Uh, as I said before, I tried to, well, uh, in the field of Glotto-Chronology, you're sort of forced to look to other language families, well-established language families where you can get a timeline, maybe from uh, things that were written centuries or millennia ago. So in Indo-European, we have a, a pretty good timeline of, of the breakup. And if you look at the diversity of Indo-European languages and try to match it up with the diversity that you find in other language families, you can get a sort of a rough idea of uh, when that language family began to break up. So it's, like I said before, for Indo-European, uh, maybe one of the best guesses is that Indo-European broke up about 6,000 years ago. And when we look at Nadine or Athabasca Neaklinkit, we don't see quite as much time depth, maybe, but maybe we do. For example, let, look at Indo-European. We have the mainstream Indo-European languages that are still spoken, but we also have languages, a whole branch of Indo-European that was only found in inscriptions, Hittite, uh, Luvian, Lydian, Lyc uh, you know, uh, Lycian, I think it's called, that were found in writing only and had disappeared. Now these languages still have a recognizable system of inflection of verbs. You can compare the inflection of Hittite verbs quite readily with the inflection of verbs in Sanskrit and yeah, Greek and other. Oh, anyway, but <clears throat> in Tlingit, However, it's much more difficult to connect the, the, the verb structure uh, than it is with any Indo-European languages. So the time depth is pretty deep. And I'm putting it at 5,000, but it could actually be deeper than that. It could be 6,000 or more. Well, that reminds me of my one of the few uh, lessons I recall from my lessons in Glotto chronology in graduate school, which was the one of the key words that that connected Indo-European with Sanskrit was the word for salmon. Oh yeah, and <laughs> it's also found in Tocharian, which is spoken all the way over, you know, in China or something. Oh yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah. So I have another question here. Um, one hypothesis is that the Thlingit raven and eagles represented two different populations. The eagles migrated down, migrating downriver found a population already living on the coast. If this is so, what language group might that have been? Well, this is a really complicated question. I took us, <clears throat> I raised it uh, in this one paper I wrote early on called uh, Clinket colon uh, portmanteau language family question mark. Um, there are a number of doublets in Clinket uh, that seem to suggest that maybe one one member of the one member of the doublet came from one dialect of Clinket whereas another member of the dialect another a uh, member of the doublet came from a different Tlingit dialect. And, but it's so difficult to prove, okay, which, first of all, 
can we establish these different dialects as, as can we recognize them when we see them? And second, which was which? Which one uh, lived in what area? So we get, just to give one example, we get the word for fu, uh, foot, hus, and we get the word for footprint, which is hus e t. It starts with an X underlined apostrophe, hus X underlined apostrophe U S. But um, in a song, we find this uh, phrase yes hus e t, which appears to be something like a almost a pejorative of yes e t. So instead of getting the underlined X apostrophe, you get an underlined K apostrophe, push. And instead of the S, you get a SH, push ET instead of hus ET. So you get two changes, different changes in the same lexical item. That's one of the things that makes me think, okay, one of these is probably comes from one dialect uh, maybe the one that was considered to be the backward dialect. That's why it's used pejoratively. And the other one came from the majority dialect. And but which was which and which lived where, who knows? But yeah, no, it could be quite, uh, I mean, it could be that uh, say the, the, the eagle population said kush iti, and the raven population on the coast said Kos -e -t, and they could have used the interior pr uh, dialect pronunciation of that just as a kind of a pejorative or a funny way to say something. But that's just speculation. Well, thank you. Um, we have another question. Does Haida being part of the continuum mean that it may be related to Iyak and Singit? Or is it an aerial designation? It is indeed an aerial designation. Now there are th things in Haida that have been noted to be similar and it thought possibly be related to Athabascan Neak Clinkett or not Diné per se, <clears throat> but the evidence just isn't strong enough to, in my mind, to posit a genetic relationship. Um, however, one thing I've noticed, for, because I did work on Haida and Tlingit, uh, while I was working on Tlingit, and I had this background in Tlingit while I was working on Haida, I noticed that there was a strong, um, let's see, what do we call it? Say, uh, in it, into say like European languages, even though they may be of different language families, tend to converge in vocabulary and uh, idiom structure. So that, you know, they'll tend to calc either words or constructions to, uh, so that the languages become more easily convertible one to another. So it's, it's easier for, say, to translate from one European language to another than it is to translate from uh, Zulu into a European language or Chinese into a European language because they just haven't gotten that, that sort of uh, uh, language area that, that allows for more easy convertibility between languages. And with Haida and Tlingit, I noticed a lot of that, a whole lot of this convergence of uh, ways of expressing things. So like mm, in Tlingit, we say, uh, I'm happy, literally my inner being or my mind or whatever you want to call it is, ha is good. And in Haida, you say, so the my corresponds to ach, my, gooding eye, uh, mind or thoughts or feelings corresponds to clinket tu, and lagan is good corresponds to clinket yake, exactly in the same order. 
So you, it doesn't take much work to translate from one to the other in this case and in many cases. So this is what I'm calling a, sort of an aerial convergence rather than a, than a genetic uh, a tie. Well, this has been really great. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Lear. SHI invites viewers to return for our next lecture by Dr. Dr. Edward Vida, entitled Singit and the Dene Yanisian Hypothesis, which will be broadcast next Tuesday, February 2nd at noon. We have a link below the YouTube video for a survey we hope you will take a moment to complete. This will help us to continue improving our lecture series and also allow our funders to measure the impact of the program. SHI has started construction of its arts campus in downtown Juneau, which will expand opportunity for education and art. If you are interested in making a donation to the arts campus, please visit sealaskaheritage.org slash campus. Thank you, everyone, and see you on Tuesday.